Trust rates for residents living in unincorporated Brevard County will go up at the end of 2020. Our county commission now has a new chair, and there was a shakeup in the Brevard Tourism Development Council. There's always news coming out of our local government. And today, Florida Today government editor Dave Berman will give you a rundown of the latest government news. That includes efforts to save the Fusener Museum in O'Galley and a preview of the top local races in the 2020 elections. Dave, welcome back on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. So you cover all things uh, regarding the county commission and the port commission, and uh, we're going to talk about some of your latest stories. And let's begin with the topic of trash. <laughs> okay. uh, trash rates are going up in Brevard County. Uh, explain why that's happening and what is, what is the impact that homeowners are going to feel. Well, the um, county commission just recently approved a new contract with waste management. They um, decided the waste management would be the contractor still. They have a new um, seven-year contract that they're finalizing and probably will be um, completed in January. And there was one other company that bid on the contract, but waste management was the lower bidder, so they picked waste management. But the rates will be going up probably pretty significantly. Um, it could um, rise by up to $60 a year for a um, homeowner with a single family house. And that's um, largely because of increased costs and waste management is adding more staff and more equipment and trying to have pay raises for their workers. So um, those new rates would take effect um, in late 2020. And are any homeowners upset about this? Well, they, um, there wasn't um, any public comment during the meeting, but I don't think people realized how much the rates will be going up. But there might be, um, when, the, um, when there's a public hearing on the new rates, there might be more um, public comment at that time. And what, what did the county commission say? Were they comfortable with this increase? And well, they've realized that um, the contract is a seven-year contract, so in the last seven years, costs have gone up for the company, waste management, and the, they're very satisfied with the service that the company's providing to ratepayers. Um, one thing the county did consider was whether they should switch, currently the trash collected twice a week, and waste management gave them an option of, well, the rates won't go up as much if the trash is collected just once a week. But um, the county commissioners felt the, um, their constituents would not like that and decided to keep it twice a week service. Yeah, probably I think once a week seems <laughs> not enough, especially yeah. if, you're, um, if you have a lot of people living in your household, you produce a lot of trash. Right, and um, Commissioner um, Isnardi, um, who used to be a, a Palm Bay City Councilwoman, um, she was there when Palm Bay switched from twice a week to once a week, and okay. um, after that, a lot of the um, residents of Palm Bay were upset about that change, even though the rates, um, the cost was less. Um, most of the um, other towns and cities in Brevard County do have twice a week collection. And these rates, um, just to be clear, will only affect people in unincorporated portions of the county. Um, each city and town either has its um, own contracts with Waste Management or Waste Pro, which is a competing company, or they have their own, um, Rockridge and Titusville have their own um, municipal trash collection okay. divisions. That's very interesting. So it's good for people to know that it started in 2020 is when they're going to start seeing changes, up to $60 right. for, for homeowners. And it'll be late 2020 when the new budget year starts in October of 2020. But um, they wanted to get the contract in line so that people were prepared for this. Okay. And, the, and moving on, the county commission has a new chairman, uh, Commissioner Brian Lober. Um, the way it usually works is the vice chair becomes the chair, which was the case here. He was the vice chair. Um, and now he's been elected or nominated to be the chair. Um, Brian Lober has been probably the most controversial commissioner in the last um, year or so uh, because of some of his comments on social media and attacking Democrats and some of his own constituents on Facebook. Uh, was there any discussion about that when they appointed him um, to be the chair? There was no discussion during the meeting. Um, it was pretty um, quick. Um, nomination where um, Commissioner Rita Pritchett nominated um, Commissioner Lober, who was the vice chair, to become the chair, and that was there was no discussion, and he was the only nominee, and he was elected unanimously. And then Commissioner Lober nominated Commissioner Pritchett to be vice chair, and that was approved unanimously. 
But um, after the meeting, there were some um, Facebook comments about about his election. Um, Stacey Patel, who's the Democratic Party chairman in Brevard County, she was pretty upset that he was named the chair. Um, the two of them have had some conflicts on social media in the past where um, there's um, been some controversy about that. Yeah, very, very interesting. And for those who are not familiar with how the county commission works, what is the role of the chair? A lot of times it's more ceremonial, but they do have a little bit of power, especially in how meetings are conducted, right? Right. They um, the chair normally um, runs the um, who gets to speak next as far as the commissioners. There's um, commissioners um, press a button on their screen, and then the the commission chair um, pretty much goes through the order of how commissioners um, based on who buzzes in first. But um, the chair has some leeway in. Um, deciding whether, um, you know, comments are going out of line and to try and cut things off. So, and also the, um, the chair um, runs the public comment portion of the meeting where they, um, you know, might have more leeway in what people in the public might have to say during the public comment. Um, as far as the, um, the chair during the debates, usually the chair doesn't debate as much as the other commissioners. Usually the chair waits till everybody else has spoken, and then the chair is the last one to speak, and generally their comments are fairly short at the end of the debate before an item is voted on. So um, um, Commissioner um, Isnari, Christine Isnari, was the former chair, and um, she, um, early on in her term as chair, the debate seemed to go on a little longer, and then I think she made a conscious decision to try and um, keep things a little more in line and during the second part of her tenure seemed to keep order pretty well on the commission. Yeah, because that's one of the things that people don't realize unless they go to a county commission meeting is that they can go on and on forever and right. especially when a commissioner decides to get on his, you know, on his soapbox and then they can go on and on and on and I'm always like, I would not like to be the chair and have to uh, control all of that, especially when it comes to controlling your fellow commissioners. Controlling right. the public and how often, how long they speak for it is it's a little easier, but uh, so it's important to say that the chair doesn't, it's not like it's the mayor of Brevard County, then they really don't have any greater impact on policy. It's just more how meetings are conducted. Right, and the thing to um, be aware of is the when public comment happens, each um, member of the public is allowed to speak for three minutes on most yeah. issues. And then there's a timer that goes, and then when the three minutes are up, the chair tells them, well, your time's up, you're, you're done. Yeah. Um, but the commissioners themselves don't have a three-minute clock, so they can speak for- For as long clock. as they want to. Right. Yeah, we've all seen that. You've been covering county commission meetings for how long? And there's always <laughs> that guy who's like, okay. <laughs> Right. You've said it the same time, the same thing ten times in, in d ten different ways. <laughs> it's time <laughs> to move on, right? Yeah, and the, the meetings have um, some of the meetings have gone on for five, six, seven hours. Yeah, and um, more recently, the meetings are a little, been a little bit shorter, so um, more manageable. And speaking of that, so uh, Commissioner John Tobiah, well, he proposed an ordinance to limit the number of ordinances. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds like a, very contradictory, but he. He has an issue with how many ordinances uh, other county commissioners are filing. Explain, and, that his, and his proposal to limit them did not go through. It was no. shut down right, right off the gates. So, but explain why he wanted that, he wanted to limit the number of ordinances that each commissioner can file. Right, these are um, cer more ceremony resolutions where it's um, honoring a person or um, maybe um, an organization or a cause for a health care issue or something like that. So he felt like at the beginning, and those happened at the beginning of the meeting, so he felt that a lot of times being taken up in these um, ceremonial resolutions and that people are waiting in the audience to speak on more substantive, substantial issues and they're waiting a long time to speak yeah. because some, some meetings there might be six or eight different resolutions that um, are brought up and each one is read word for word, and then the person who's being honored or the organization usually gets a few minutes to speak as well. Yeah. So it might take, each resolution might take 10 minutes. Yeah. And it, it might be 30 to 60 minutes before they get into 
the regular business of the county commission. And I just call myself, I said ordinance, and it's very clear. I just want to make sure that ordinances are different than resolutions because ordinances actually are what you would think. It changes policy right. in, in county government. Resolutions are more like the ceremonial stuff that you mentioned. And uh, behind this, like John Tobias really thinks that it's taking up a lot of time and it is making those meetings really, really long. If um, if each commissioner puts up, up yeah. several resolutions in a, in a you know, at a time, you know, they do take a while. And so his um, proposal was defeated three to two. Commissioner Zanardi did support him and she felt that things were getting a little out of hand in the resolution area as well. And one issue that um, she's one of the commissioners that had the most, the second most resolutions okay. in the past year, but because she was the chair, a lot of organizations go to her to put forth resolutions yeah. So that's why her numbers were higher. Yeah. I always wonder with resolutions, because really it has no real value. It is, it is more, like I said, ceremonial. And it's more about, I think, commissioners doing uh, something nice for a group that either supported them or a cause that they feel that is that needs some kind of uh, attention. But a lot of times it's just wonder, okay, so what happens after those resolutions are passed? So mm -hmm. is that caused suddenly fixed? Does it get a boost? Or is it just something that makes everybody feel good and you get a photo in, in the county commission chambers? Well, it's partly that. And um, one thing that um, some of the commissions that support having these resolutions say is that um, there's um, 600,000 people in the county. So why not recognize six of them a meeting or six organizations? Um, and also creates public awareness for maybe a, a, an organization or a cause or some event that's coming up. So that's part of the reason that um, some of the commissioners feel it's important to have these resolutions. Um, so now Commissioner T Tobia has started a new tactic where once, a, once another commissioner reaches 12 resolutions in a year, he's going to vote against all their resolutions. <laughs> so it's going to be like something for childhood <laughs> cancer, and he's going to be voting against it. I just want to, I think that's going to be hilarious. <laughs> well, he's, he's already <laughs> started that. Um, he, he says that, um, you know, his resolution didn't pass to limit the resolutions. So yeah. he, as um, just uh, to make a point, he's going to be voted against them. And he, and, and he Has started, he voted against any? He's voted against three so far. Do you know what they were? Well, um, a couple of them were related to healthcare issues. Okay. And um, so, um, and he said at the beginning of the, the meeting, he doesn't, yeah. it's not that he's against. Don't take it personal. Don't take it personal, <laughs> but that's just what he's going to do. I'm just trying to grandstand. Okay, that's, that's our county commission is so colorful because there's always, <laughs> these, always these issues. <laughs> it's just like, that should not be an issue, but suddenly it becomes an issue here. Uh, but, I mean, it keeps you busy, and it, and it keeps our politicians um, also, keep, makes them more entertaining, I guess. Um, so speaking of, again, of our county commissioners, um, two of them will be up for re-election in 2020. Uh, we mentioned John Tabaya, he's up for re-election, and also Christina Snardi. She has a Democratic opponent already, the mayor of Palm Bay, William right. Capote. Uh, very interesting that her husband, um, David Asnardi, was arrested. Um, he has not gone to trial yet, but he was arrested on charges of, I believe, racketeering, all of that related to Palm Bay City Hall. Uh, explain, as, do you see that race as becoming contentions and, contentious and really becoming a race to watch in 2020? Well, I think it will be because um, you mentioned um, the connection with her Christina Zanardi's husband, and also Wim Capote is currently the mayor of Palm Bay, and there was a, a critical audit of Palm Bay where the, the mayor Capote was named um, as far as some issues uh, that he had also, um, for example, um, the, the car that the city provided him, there was, there was some feeling okay. in audit that he wasn't um, entitled to the car and he shouldn't have been given that car. And okay. also, he also was mentioned in, um, he wasn't charged with um, any crimes in the Davis Nardi case, but he also was mentioned in some of the supporting documents in a fairly negative way. Yeah, and for those who are not familiar, so David Nardi was accused of, uh, with an associate, of trying to frame some of the, the, sit, uh, the, com the councilmen in Palm Bay um, for drugs and for something else. And William Capote was mentioned in the documents 
um, because another councilman, Trey Holton, who is not in office anymore, apparently was arranging prostitutes for him in Tallahassee. Of course, everybody denies any wrongdoing, but it is a very sort of convoluted story. And I think it's going to be a pretty nasty race. If there's money in that race from both sides, which I assume there will be, I mean, it's going to be pretty ugly. There was, um, it, it could be, um, depending on if the two candidates decide to go negative on one another, there's a lot of um, things that they could bring up if they, yeah. if they want to. On both sides. On both sides. And also, it, there might be outside groups, even though the candidates might not do it themselves, there might be outside political groups that sponsor ads in favor or opposed to one of the candidates. So that um, could happen too. And we, we should mention, um, just to clarify, that um, not, neither, neither Christina Zanardi nor William Capote have been um, accused yes, um, criminally of anything. And also um, other people besides the two you mentioned, um, not, no, no one else has been charged in the case. Yeah. And let's talk about John Tobiah, the other city commissioner who's running for re-election. Has anybody filed to run against him? Um, there has no, been no opposition so far to his candidacy, um, but um, it's possible a Democrat, he's, all the sitting commissioners are Republicans, it's possible a Democrat could file to run against him. And there's a, there will be a third race in um, North Brevard. Um, Rita Pritchett will, 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 right. will um, be running for re-election um, in 2020. There's um, three, can, three commissioners running for election in 2020, um, and then um, the other two seats are up in 2022. So, um, and all, like I said, all the sitting commissioners are Republicans, and the, the last um, Democrat that was a commissioner was Robin Fisher, which w who left office some years ago. And uh, that's the seat that Rita Pritchett has today. Right. And she doesn't seem to be in any danger of, of being challenged or unseated ways. So that's a pretty solid seat, and she's very, well, very there, popular. Well, there are... I, I think she is popular in the community, but there are two Democrats that already have filed to run against her, um, including um, one who's run for that seat before, Dwight Siegler, who's mm -hmm. a local um, activist in the community of North Brevard, and there, and there is another Democrat candidate also seeking the seat at this point. So if those two go forward, there would be a Democratic primary in 2020 for the, um, to challenge Rita Pritchett. Okay, so let's move on to the arts um, and the Fusener Museum in, in O'Galley. Um, Florida Tech took over the museum years ago, and they're um, in the process of shutting it down, I believe, next year. Um, they say that they're losing money, uh, but there is a group in Rohr County who's trying to save the museum. What's, this, what's the status of that? Well, right now, um, like you said, um, Florida Institute of Technology has had agreed to run the museum for 10 years, and the 10 years would be up um, in 2021. And they um, are planning to um, put the building and the land around it on the market for sale. So um, there are um, there's some arts um, organizations um, that are in the community, the um, O'Galley Arts District, and some of the um, members of the um, Tourist Development Council Cultural Committee are pretty active in trying to keep the museum in operation, either that site or a different site. But the question is, can they raise the money to do that? To do that. And um, they have pitched a lot of ideas. Obviously, none of them, we haven't seen a, seen a full plan, but they have proposed a few things to try to save the museum. I think one of them is that the Brevard Cultural Alliance would take over the museum, but they also brought up uh, that right now that there is no leadership in, in, in the Cultural Alliance to do that. What are some of the options that they're looking at and really how realistic are they? Well, one option that was brought up was um, to try to convince Florida Institute of Technology to make it an arts and science museum to be more in line with, with the, the college. An the institute of technology. Yeah. Um, but, um, and the um, Florida Tech um, officials who were attending a recent meeting said they would bring that all the ideas are brought up back to the, the board of directors and to the college president. Um, but there was no firm commitment that, oh, we'll change our mind and we won't sell the museum. 
So yeah. it's um, they the um, university said they've put a lot of money into the museum, about seven million dollars overall over that um, eight or nine year period so far, and that the um, attendance at the museum is not um, that great, and they're. Um, they also feel that, and right now it's free admission because they felt that um, to have somebody take tickets at the gate is cost more than they mm -hmm. would make. So it's um, it's kind of a money losing proposition at this point. So they're um, planning to um, put the building on and the land on the market next year, and they hope to recoup some of the losses through the sale and put it back into other university programs. And they're, they're saying that because they're, they're a private university, they don't get um, state grants. So it's, it's tuition of their students that that's are paying right. to run the museum. And they feel that's not the um, ideal use of tuition money. Yeah, they did get a million dollars from the Fusener family. Just, just, just want to make sure that, that that's mentioned. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this issue, and you know, uh, nobody wants to see a museum close. Obviously, and I don't think you know most people like the idea of having a museum in their community. However, I always wonder how many people actually go to that museum, and, and really, could uh, the people who run it have done a better job to make it more of a community attraction? I mean, was there any discussion about that really? Was there any mismanagement of, of the museum, and why is it why why is it not attracting enough people? Well, I think the um, museum tried to at attract more people with um, like national touring shows, mm -hmm. and they found that those those shows were so expensive that they've stopped doing them. Um, one thing that um, was a suggestion was to market the museum more as a, an events center where. Um, local organizations would rent the museum for um, parties or fundraisers or other types of events, and th there was um, there was some controversy about after FIT um, took over the museum. There was a group called um, the, the Council of One Hundred, which was um, people in the community that donate at least a thousand dollars a year to the museum, and then. Um, when once FIT took over the museum, after that, that council was disbanded. So, okay. a lot of the people that donated money to the museum pretty regularly decided, well, they don't really want us involved, so we're not going to be donating money anymore. Yeah. And um, so, the one thing that maybe is the most likely option or most possible option is to find either corporate don donor or a group of corporate donors or um, wealthy individuals in the community to make major contributions to keep the museum going. Yeah, and it's still kind of on that topic. Uh, there was a shakeup on the Tourism Development Council. Um, a lot of new people on the council explain what happened and why is that the TDC so, why is there so much attention given to them, you know? They seem like this. They could seem like this obscure, you know, government body that really, but it gets a lot of attention from our county commissioners. Right, and the Tourist Development Council, um, along with the Space Coast Office of Tourism, which is the county agency that manages the tourism industry in Brevard County, um, they oversee sixteen million dollars a year in taxes, which come from people who rent hotel rooms or or short term rentals like condos. So it's a big amount of money and... The, and everybody wants a piece of it. <laughs> yes, and it, there is a, a set amount that goes to different um, sectors. For example, the cultural um, gets um, a certain portion, beaches gets a certain portion, um, Brevard Zoo gets a certain portion. It's kind of a set percentage, but then there's some discretionary money as well, and the biggest portion, I think, um, about forty-seven percent goes to marketing area to attract more people to the community. And who are the new people on the council? Well, um, one of the changes is um, actually the county commissioner seat. Um, Brian Lober was the member who was on the tourist commission, and now he's going to be replaced by um, Christina Zanardi. So the, the Chairman of the commission, who became Brian Lober recently, gets to choose the next member 
and then um, their um, PK Kapoor is rejoining the, the board and he'll be um, starting in January and he um, he was on the board before but then was taken off the board so he'll be re rejoining it he's a, a hotel general manager and then there'll be some other seats that will have new people in, in January as well um, two of the um, long-term people that are on the board um, just had their last meeting Lorley Thompson who's a restaurant owner in Tyesville she's on the board for 20 years wow. and now there's new term limit rules in effect that started this past year so anybody that's on for eight years or more cannot serve any longer on the board and um, Tim Daratani who's been on the board this is his eighth year so he'll be leaving the board as well he he's a former state legislator and he was pretty heavily involved in the arts community and as he's well. the one part part of the group that's trying to save the food center museum what is we have only one minute left but what is the main uh, sticking issue with the TDC and uh, there's a lot of debate on how those dollars, those tourism dollars, should be spent. Um, very quickly explain to people why, why is, has it become so controversial? Well, I think um, there's some people on the Tourist Council who feel that um, beaches are the most important thing and that a lot of the money should go to um, beach renourishment and they're concerned that some of the money is being funneled off into other areas. While other people um, are looking at um, capital projects to help the tourism industry attract more people. So, um, and, and then there's um, the cultural organizations that get money from the tourism tax. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different issues, different um, sectors that are trying to get a piece of that money. Dave Berman, thank you so much for being on the show again. Well, thank you. I'll see you soon. Yep. That's I Am Brevard for today. You can find this episode and local news online at floridatoday.com. I'll see you again next week.